This episode is brought to you by Fani Indian Cuisine, Sudbury. When you listen to our podcast, do you wonder about this town where the stories come from? If you are a Valen resident or from a neighboring town, have you thought about the town's past? If it was always so glorious or are there some things we would rather forget? Which stories we hear are just urban legends and which are true? It is of course impossible to cover all aspects of Valen history in one episode. So in this episode, we'll focus on some trivia and important but not so talked about Valen history. Every now and then, you come across a story that is a storyteller's delight. It is such a pleasure to share with our listeners the sponsor for this episode, Pani Indian Cuisine, Sudbury. Since 2009, Pani Indian Cuisine has been serving customers from the surrounding areas. Pani is a brainchild of Vimy Verma. With a degree in Indian classical instrument sitar, Vimy is an artist at heart. A resident of Sudbury for 36 years, Vimy loves to connect with people through music, entertainment and of course, food. Why am I giving you this tidbits of history about her? Well, interesting story. In 1979, she stepped into radio, hosting a live 2-hour segment broadcasting from the MIT radio station. She also started a television program in 1981 focused on South Asian culture. We really thank our sponsor Vimy of Pani Indian Cuisine for the support she has shown for Women of Valen podcast. On a personal note, I can say that her food and restaurant reflects the artist in her. Pani defies the stereotypical notion of spicy Indian takeout. It's a flavorful, luxurious, and aesthetic dining experience in New England. We highly recommend it. In this episode, we talk with Valen historian extraordinaire Jane Siaka. Jane has lived in Valen for over 50 years. During this time she has been the member president and curator of the Valent Historical Society. The town and community have benefited tremendously by her knowledge sharing over the years. Since we are a podcast about women, let's start by talking about women from Valent's history. Did you know that Valent is not only home to remarkable women today but has been this way through history? Consider Lydia Maria Child, an American abolitionist, women's rights activist and novelist. And still, while industrialists and families of Valen have roads named after them, there is nothing in memory of her. What is surprising and kind of sad is even Jane didn't know about Lydia Maria Child's Valen connection. Her fascination with the people left behind by history led her to discover Lydia Maria Child, Wales's most prominent resident. I think that I've always been drawn to uh the people that were left out of history. And one of one of the interesting things about working at Minuteman National Historical Park, which is one of the uh places where the American Revolution started, uh on April 19, 1775 is the fact that all the people there were basically farmers on the on the side that lived here so these are not george washington and john adams and uh john hancock the names that people know these are people that just were ordinary people uh who were uh you know who were interested in freedom uh perhaps in a different way and and it hit them directly so get ready to rewind the clocks and learn more about the history of Wayland through the eyes of Wayland's renowned historian Jane Siak the reason i got interested in Lydia Maria Child had to do with Concord and not um with Wayland so she had a very low profile in Wayland in fact if you say her name to most Wayland people they don't know who she is um and she wanted to hide her light under a bushel but i think she did it to an extreme but the reason that i got interested in her was the fact that in 1876 she went to visit 
uh, her friends in Concord, and they were the Alcott family. Uh, so Lydia Mariah Child had been very good friends in her younger days with Louisa May Alcott's mother. And she went to see her, and she wrote an incredible description of the house that I was working at at the time, the Orchard House. And I said, oh, I think this woman's from Wayland. I'd better find out about her. And that is actually how I started, because of something that I read in Concord, remembered uh, that she had some connection with Wayland, although there's no street named after her. Uh, there's no school named after her. There's no building named after her. And I would say she was Wayland's most prominent resident. She's now, she's now in the Women's Hall of Fame uh, in Seneca Falls. She's in the Abolition Hall of Fame in Peterborough, New York. Uh, so, yes, and uh, there is a young woman who came to see me a few years ago who was studying Lydia Mariah Child in Bologna, Italy. Um, so she has a reputation that is probably better known outside of Wayland. But if you say her name here, it's like who? And I, and she's someone I just admire. So great. While making her story more accessible through books or through other mediums would certainly help, it's about time for the town of Wayland to honor her memory in some way. Something for us to think about. Jane has done extensive research on Lydia Maria Child. Let's hear some more things about her. I promise it's going to surprise you. Well, first of all, she was a person of her time. So what we might look at, I mean, there were um, maybe notions she had. For example, her first book, Habamak, which is about a Native American. And there is, there is some, the noble savage sort of, uh, element to it. Uh, but really where she was outstanding was that I don't think, she, and she says it, she says, I don't know if I was just born without prejudice or how I acquired it, but I don't think she uh, had prejudice. When she talked about human rights, she meant for everyone, no matter what your race, no matter what your ethnicity, no matter anything. She wanted human rights and people to be treated humanely and humanly as possible. And years later, the impact of Lydia Maria Child's achievements manifests itself as active leadership of women of Wayland in our schools, a trend that dates all the way back to 1879, says Jane. In 1920, uh, there were over 200 women who registered. But what I did was find out that a lot of women, so basically after 1879, a woman who lived in, in Wayland could vote for school committee. And to do that, you had to register to vote. So if So I looked at a lot of the women who registered to vote before 1920. And Kay Gardner Westcott did most of the research on the women who, uh, who registered in 1920. But I did a lot of research on the people who registered after 1879. And there were many, many women and they did not have to re-register again. Once you were registered, uh, you were eligible to vote. So that seemed to be uh, quite popular in town was women who, for whatever reason, uh, registered to vote so they could vote for school committee. The vote doubled from 1916 for president uh, to 1920. The number of voters in Wayland doubled. So that tells you the significance of the women who registered to vote. Yet, as you might expect, Jane's passion to uncover what is left behind by history doesn't always paint a glorious picture of Valen and the surrounding areas. I worked at Minuteman National Historical Park, which is a Revolutionary War park, uh, that while people were fighting for their freedom from uh, Great Britain, that we were 
keeping slaves, that some of those men were slave owners. And this appalled me. <laughs> and I started saying, well, maybe Concord had uh, slavery, but certainly Wayland would never do that. And I was I just, I, I, yes, surprise, I, I identified somewhere in the neighborhood of at least 50 people who must have been enslaved during the period of slavery here from its founding in 1638 to its virtual abolition around 1780. While researching for this episode, I read about the differences in slavery in the North and South. It intrigued me, so I asked Jane. Of course, I was touching a sensitive topic here. And I had to choose my words carefully. Jane made this very clear. So, to me, slavery is an abomination. <laughs> no matter you, you know what, what race you are, where it is, it's an abomination. So to say it was different, but primarily the difference, I think, has to do with the climate. So it's not that, you know, enslaved people were treated so wonderfully. It was different uh, so that there was not the need for field workers all year. Uh, you couldn't do it. Uh, here. So they were more assisting farmers. Uh, they tended to live in their, in the uh, master's houses. But it's th the same in that they are totally uh, subject to their masters. So that if they married and they married someone from a different uh, town or a different family in, in Sudbury, that meant that they did not live with their spouses. If they had children and the children were uh, could be sold because they belonged to the master and not the parents. And all this was done in Wayland. Uh, so, so, I mean, it's a life you can't call your own. So uh, to me, it's, it's just nowhere, no place to live. But I'd say the differences in uh, I, and again, you know, there's not a lot about uh, the treatment of, of enslaved people, but uh, these are Puritans. They like to punish everybody. So if they were putting uh, white people in ducking stools and, and stocks, certainly I don't know that they would have been uh, that much uh, more lenient with <laughs> with enslaved people. So, and obviously there was a reluctance to talk about it, except in one instance where an enslaved person actually uh, shot himself intentionally. So that I do know. So yeah, it's an abomination, no matter how you call it. But the differences I think had to do with the uh, economy uh, and it had to do with the climate. Sad and gut-wrenching, as Jean puts it, to think that in terms of racial diversity, the most diverse Wayland ever has been was when slaves were here. So if you want to talk about diversity in Wayland, you, talk, you, you have to talk about the African-American uh, who were here enslaved. Um, because that was when Wayland was its most diverse, which is mind-blowing when you think about it. Yes, let that sink in. And not, not that we have never had African-American families who live here or who live here, but yes, if you want to talk about racial diversity, that was slavery. Sad to say, really gut-wrenching. And I don't know how much people want to really uh, think about that, but our our issues with race uh, certainly go down, go back to the the earliest years of of the founding of this town. 
Wayland is not just 400 years old, which I said, but that is the history of European uh, settlement. But there, we also have archaeological uh, finds in town that take our history way back to indigenous people who uh, were here. And that's a whole nother uh, group of people that were certainly mistreated. Uh, as profoundly as as African Americans, and and Boston, by the way, is the most uh, I've read and studied that it's the most segregated large city in the country. Diversity, racial or otherwise, remains poor in Wayland. However, over the years, Wayland has welcomed resident of all faith and race. When Jane arrived in Wayland, there were no temples. Temple Shri Tikwa acquired its own land in 1981. Islamic Center of Boston was opened in 1988. And in 2021, which is this year, a Human Rights, Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee was formed, of which both Jane and I are founding members. Over the years, Jane has written extensively about race in Massachusetts. I asked Jane to share one story that is close to her heart. Hear her tell the story of Captain Wade of the U.S. Navy. I actually wrote down a, a, a bit that I had given in a paper. And of course, it came from, guess who, Lydia Mariah Child. And she recorded uh, in, her, uh, in her letter, in a letter, uh, during the Civil War or at the time of the Civil War because she was very active uh, in that uh, and also helping defend a man named John Brown who stormed Harper's Ferry in 1859 and really hastened the, uh, uh, the coming of the Civil War. But anyway, she talks about uh, somebody that she knows, his name was Thomas Wade, Captain Wade of the U.S. Navy. I'm just going to read it the way she wrote it. Uh, has been a bitter pro-slavery man, violent and vulgar in his talk against abolitionists and niggers. She said it. Uh, two years ago, he was for having us mobbed because we advocated emancipating and arming the slaves. So this is now the Southern. He has been serving in the vicinity of New Orleans and has come through home on a furlough, an outspoken abolitionist. He not only says it in private, but has delivered three lectures in town in which he has publicly announced the total change in his sentiments since he has had an opportunity to know something on the subject. A few days ago, he was going to in the cars from Boston to Roxbury when a colored soldier entered the car. Attempting to seat himself, he was repulsed by a white man who rudely exclaimed, I'm not going to ride with niggers. Captain Wade, who sat a few seats further forward, rose up in all the gilded glory of his naval uniform and called out, come here, my good fellow. I've been fighting alongside of people of your color and glad enough I was to have them by my side come and sit with me. And so the, that touched me very deeply because the moral of the story is that so many people reject other people because they don't know them. So then when they say, you know, they don't want black people living in their town or they don't want somebody living in their town, that is, puts everybody in the same category instead of treating someone as an individual. And that is what Lydia Mariah Child was most, uh, was most, uh, I think you, it, I think it touched you. I paused for a second and I had to. This conversation, as I said, is not on all going to be glorious and happy. And we are so used to glorious and happy, right? There it is. We don't know somebody, but we condemn them because of what we were told we should know about them. And there is the moral of the story that all of us need to learn today. 
The first question we ask our guest is usually how they ended up here. The answers reflect the modern day priorities and all that Valen has to offer today. Things like schools, commute, pastoral beauty, baseball leagues for men, and a close knit community are some of the things our guests have mentioned over the three seasons. But there is a downside to this too. People come and leave. I I think that is true, and I think it's uh, it's unfortunate. Um, and I I see that in people who used to devote themselves to volunteering, uh, and even that has changed so that there are not as many people. But yes, I think more people come today uh, for schools, and then they leave. And Wayland, to let's face it, is a very expensive town to live in. And then, how do you fix that? How do you get connected with the roots? I also want to give a shout out to Wayland because, um, to me, we do a third grade program at the Historical Society in conjunction with their studying the American Revolution. And to me, it is just so special. And I think a lot of people have been exposed uh, to whale in history through that program because, you know, the parents know they're going there. And it's a preparation for Minuteman National Historical Park. But I think one of the most interesting things about this town is the fact that you are so close to history that you know people all over the kids all over the country are reading about the American Revolution and where it started and how it happened and here people from this town participated in it. They went off to, to conquer. They went off on the battle road on April 19th. And so when the kids study it, they can see it. They're here. It is, it is their history, and that is everyone's history. So I, I think people, this town is almost 400 years old. And, and you know, is and you know, I think you have to make it relevant uh, to people for them to be interested in it. But if it's only, you know, were there any people from India who ever lived here before? You know, that kind of thing. Why aren't there African Americans living here? What is the evolution of this town? Uh, and even if you are here only for the school years, what's the evolution of the Wayland Public Schools? I mean, uh, you know, to me, it's so obvious that uh, you should, to, to be connected to a community uh, means to know a little bit about uh, how it got to be your community. Yes, it is their history. For most, U.S. history is so relevant. Yet for others, we need to make specific portions of history relevant for them. Coming back to the biggest attraction of Wayland. No, no, not the words, but the schools. So, of course, most people today move into the town for schools. But was that the case in 1968? I arrived here with an 11-month-old child um, because we were looking for uh, both my husband and I went to school in Boston and we were looking for a place we wanted to start a family and we had an 11 month old and we wanted to find a place that had good schools. It is, it was a lot quieter. Um, I just asked my husband, he said we had two traffic lights when we came here in 1970, over 50 years ago one at, on Route 20 and one at the intersection of 27 in Kichichuit. So, yes, it was a lot. And it was a time when a lot of people were coming to Boston because of uh, the schools and, and the reputation of the schools. It came about really after uh, World War II and the, uh, the advent of high tech in this area the development of Route 128 as an industrial nexus, as a, a place to... Uh, and so the people who lived here starting in the 50s and uh, throughout the 60s, they were attracted engineers and scientists and professors and uh, doctors and uh, people who were interested in good education. 
And so they promoted it. And the first real manifestation of that was uh, that uh, incredible Wayland High School, the original one from 1960, which was really a very avant-garde uh, building because it was unfortunately uh, for us later designed for Southern California living. Uh, but, but it was, uh, it, it made national news. And therefore, it, it brought people to come here. And so really the movement uh, by the people who lived here was the promotion of good schools. Can you imagine living in Wayland in 1960s? It surprised me. It really is true. The more things change, the more things remain the same. 50 years down, reasons for moving to Wayland are still the same. Picture this. Not too long ago, because of the rail connection between Boston and the Wayland Depot, the town was a thriving business center. Yes, and it wasn't just farms and plantations. Where we have a Starbucks today, there was a bent shoe factory. And the workers working in bent shoe factory lived in small quarters called 10-footers and built shops and houses around Main Street and Commonwealth Avenue area. In some sense, James Madison Bent is single-handedly responsible for giving Kuchichwit Village its current character. Well, I found it uh, very quiet because I didn't have a car for the first year and I had an 11-month-old. So I only really went to the grocery store shopping and I did it on the weekends because my husband went to work and I was home with, you know, I was a stay-at-home mother. I have always found myself asking how this rich history is recorded. How are historians made? How was it recorded in Wayland? Well, history is recorded in Wayland, basically uh, the H Wayland Historical Society, which of course I, I have a, a, very, <laughs> a very special feeling for, uh, was formed in 1954 to, um, you know, to be a repository for Wayland history. Uh, it is also, uh, and now, of course, uh, the movements of Wayland Library has been very significant also in trying to uh, digitize uh, elements of Wayland history, as did the town of Wayland uh, has uh, done a lot with that. So the movement now is to digitize, but basically we have uh, many, many thousands of photos, uh, documents, everything, uh, newspapers that pertain to Wayland history. It took some research for Jane to know about Lydia Maria Child and slavery in Wayland. Just think about all the people from different cultures, races, ethnicity, and sexuality who have lived in Wayland and needed their history recorded as well. Who's doing that? If we are to preserve our history, we sure need some young budding historians in the next generation. Jane's reflections offer some guidance. Okay, so that is the sixty-four thousand dollar question. That's a wonder, a wonderful question because I, I think those of us in the historical society, the you know the the ones who've been there for years and and are the most devoted to Wayland history, kind of bemoan the fact that uh, maybe we don't do enough to realize that. Uh, that history happens. You know, this interview, uh, when I hang up with you, is history. <laughs> so the the issue is that, um, you know, and I, I actually did talk to to several people that work with me and, and I work with them uh, about this. And they said, we are so busy uh, trying to catch up in inventory and know exactly what we have uh, that we have probably been remiss on uh, on a lot of the uh, things that are happening in Wayland now. And I also would like to put in a plug uh, to your listeners that uh, especially people of Asian descent 
would love to have representation that we don't have now, would love to see uh, documents uh, and, and life stories even of, of people's journeys to Wayland from China or India or wherever. So yes, if, if people are out there, um, I'd like to reach out to them and say, please, uh, we are online. So please uh, send us your, your thoughts and uh, your interests and your stories because we want them. But now, of course, the news media is not as powerful as it used to be where we used to clip a lot of articles from the town crier. Um, and now the move is toward digitization. So yes, a lot of us have been involved in that. And of course, uh, going through the material we have, because if it needs to be preserved, uh, some of it in making sure that it is being protected so that it will last in the future. But yes, we would love uh, any help that we could get to document uh, what is happening in town now. Uh, the Wayland Library, which is a town organization, it's a town government, um, they are doing uh, a, a wonderful job trying to put information on uh, something called Digital Commonwealth and Internet Archive. And if you go to either of those, um, you will see a lot of uh, representation of Wayland. The Wayland Historical Society has a representation also on Digital Commonwealth. So I'd say the library, and I've actually, and, and the current curator of the Historical Society, Kay Gardner Westcott, and I have actually been assisting the library in some of their uh, work. So, and the other is uh, the town of Wayland who contain, has the minutes to meetings and other things. Uh, they have re voter registration. And so those things are now available uh, digitally online. I'm a sucker for historical trivia. While I had Jane captive, I had to ask what's her favorite Valen trivia? I think the, the most important historical trivia is that Wayland is the original site of the Sudbury Plantation in 1638. The founding of what is today Sudbury and Wayland happened in Wayland at what is now the North Cemetery, which says the first town center. So I think that is the confusion that in 1780, when the town divided, uh, this side, the east side, wanted to leave uh, Sudbury. Now, there were times that Sudbury side, the west side, wanted to leave us, but inflation and the amount of taxation that was going on because of the inflation from uh, the Revolutionary War made the people of the east side more anxious to leave. And so they gave the name to the west side and they became Sudbury and we became East Sudbury. And then from 1780 to 1835, and basically uh, we later became Wayland. So that is it. So then, and they have claimed and gotten a lot of glory that really started uh, here in Wayland at the town center, which is part of at North Cemetery. So that's my favorite trivia of the town, and one that has it has you know I, I've sung this song for for 50 years. <laughs> wow. But hold on. We're not done with Wayland Trivia yet. But names are a big deal. Just think about these factoids. Dudley Pond was not always Dudley Pond. In an old map from 1775, it is referred to as Johnson's Pond. We do know that Dudley and Johnson families lived around but why the name change no one has a clue also the long pond was changed to lake kuchichwit because boston's mayor at that time thought bostonians would like an indian name and finally our own town has had three names sudbury east sudbury and wayland ever driven by lavin's liquor and taken a left to the stonesbridge road 
Did you ever think why it was called Stones Bridge Road? I sure did. And guess what? There is in fact a Stones Bridge. But it was only in use until 1955 when Hurricane Diane damaged it. The town decided to build a new bridge and road beside it instead of repairing the Stones Bridge. Other bridges also survived to this day and are still beautiful memories of the years past. There are so many of these hidden gems of places in Wayland. When asked about her favorite place in Wayland, Jane didn't mention any bridges, but it's close. The most important spot in Wayland is the Sudbury River because it really gave life to uh, this community. Uh, it is the reason that this area was settled. Uh, it has a history that goes back, uh, you know, long before, but also celebrated by, uh, by Henry David Thoreau, who I got to know very well up in Concord. But the Sudbury River is the defining uh, moment uh, of Wayland. I told you, I love historical trivia. So let's end it with one of my favorites. It's my favorite perhaps because it relates to my neighborhood in Cochitwit. Ever heard of Mansion Inn? Mm -hmm. Not Mansion Beach. But you probably have certainly been to Dudley Pond's Mansion Beach, right? Well, this fail in trivia is amazing. Residents of more than a dozen houses by the current Mansion Beach and the area at the intersection of West Plain Street and Old Connecticut Path may be surprised to know that where they live, there once was a castle. Yes, a castle overlooking the Dudley Pond. To this day, Castle Gate Road preserves the two pillars that mark the entry into the residence of businessman Simpson. This castle was later turned into the Mansion Inn and served Boston suburbanites until 1956, when a fire burnt it down. It was then that the area was cleared up and approval to build 14 new houses was granted. So the question is, do you live in one of those houses? It was a privilege and honor to have Jane on the show. We couldn't cover everything, of course. We can have one episode dedicated to history pretty much every season. With this, I would love to know how you like this episode. Now that we are meeting in person again, buy me some chai at Pani Indian Cuisine, Sudbury. Their chai is the best and we will talk more history. Thank you so much for listening. Don't forget to review, rate and subscribe to our show. This is your host Yamini and you were listening to Women of Wayland, the podcast.